in so a sentence so that I don't lie and I'm not lying or whatever, and <laughs> false advertising and stuff like that. But let's go ahead and open with prayer and I'll give Tyson as much time as we can here. So, Father God, thank you so much for this time together today and we thank you for Tyson and the gifting that you've given him, the mind to reason and to, um, to look into these things that you've given us so that we can be uh, assured of your presence in our lives. And, and so as we look at science uh, today, Lord, I pray that you would Give us a discerning mind and an understanding mind as we weigh these things. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, come on in, everybody. All right, well, thanks, Scott. And um, thank you guys for having me out once again. Last week was super fun, and I got a lot of positive feedback on uh, the, the lecture on Islam. It seems like St. Anscars is full of people who just have a thirst for knowing about Islam and being able to reach out to Muslims with the gospel, so I was happy with that. Um, some of you have said you wanted more information about that or a way to recover that information. Um, this is my YouTube username. Uh, if you go to this channel, you can look up the lectures I gave over at Shoreline. I gave a four-week lecture series on Islam that goes much more in-depth on Islam than I did in the one week that I came here uh, last week. So if you want more information on that, and actually since we're recording this lecture, that'll be available there as well, um, if that's okay. Sure. All right. Sure. Um, so today's topic, uh, unbeknownst to me, was fine-tuning and recording to Scott, but we're, we're not going to be delving specifically into fine-tuning. What I wanted to talk today is more broad. It's science and religion. So just a show of hands, do we have any scientists in the room? No one is a professional scientist. Okay, so we've got a lot of, you know, lay people when it comes to science and religion. And obviously as Christians, we want to affirm that science is a valid way of coming to truth, right? The Bible affirms certain scientific facts. Um, so we need to learn how to think correctly about science and religion. And so my job as an apologist is to defend the truth of Christianity against objections to that truth. We want to say that Christianity is true. There are people out there who say that Christianity is false. And one of the ways that happens is be in a conflict, supposed conflict, between science and religion. Okay? So, when this topic is brought up, science and religion, does anybody feel any sort of just immediate anxiety or nervousness or, you know, tension when it comes to those topics? I think that's pretty natural for most of us, right? We hear science and religion just put together like that, and suddenly it's like, you know, you're talking about politics at Thanksgiving dinner or something, you know? It's like, oh, what do I do? Okay, so if Christianity is true, God created the entire universe, then there's nothing actually that is true that's going to conflict with science or religion, religion being Christianity. And so I don't think we need to be intimidated by it. But because we're bombarded with objections and these claims, we need to learn how to think about science and religion. Uh, what's kind of funny about this lecture is that I'm not actually going to be talking much about the science. Okay? I'm going to be talking about the philosophy of science. So in any field of learning, there is an underlying philosophy which just means there's an underlying way of thinking about it. We need to learn how to think really hard about the subjects that we're engaged in, and science isn't any different. So real quick, just a word association, which I love to do. What comes to mind when you think of the word science? Just hard, words. Hard the facts. Facts. And I'm going to leave, There's. I, I would draw a line here, but I think there are some things that might kind of fit in the middle, so if we find something that kind of fits in the middle between them, we can put them there. So, all right, more on science. What do you think of? In relationship to religion, I think of evolution. Evolution, okay. So maybe somewhere in here. Okay, what, what about? Reason, reason. Reason, okay. Theory. 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 Testing. Testing. Outcomes. Outcomes. Proofs. I heard proof. Experiments. Hypothesis. 
hypothesis. Okay. How about observable? Observable. Observation. Okay. Religion. Okay, we're getting there. No, no, How about no. life? Science infers religion nowadays. Okay. What do you mean by that? In terms of many people who adhere to science, they view it as a religion. Science as religion. Is it what you're saying? Yeah. As a, okay. That, that's interesting. We're going to talk pretty much exactly about that. Okay, so we've got some good uh, starting ground here on science. Let's go with religion. What kind of words pop up when you think of religion? Science. <laughs> Spiritual. It's true. Cheeky fellow. <laughs> Scientology. Okay. Beliefs. Rules. Rules. Sorry, Beliefs. Facts. Faith. 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 Miracles. Facts. Miracles. Somebody's reading the outline. Right? <laughs> okay. Anything else? <laughs> Facts and reason. I mean, oh, for okay. me, a lot of stuff on both sides implies evil. Okay, so reason over here too. Uh, where did facts go? Facts over here too. Okay. Experiment. Experiment and religion. Yeah. Experience. Exper experiment. Experiment. Like experiencing things, or experiment as in experience. You know, trying things like trying, trying things. Trying okay. People. Trying over people. Or even people that go from one religion to the next, experimenting with them until they find something that fits for them. Conversion. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, that's a good starting ground. How about cultural? Cultural, excellent. Okay. All right, that is a great starting ground. So these are the main things we think about when we think about religion and science. And so you can kind of see a difference here between how people think about science and how people think about religion. And this is very common in our culture to divide these topics in this way. And what I'm going to show you is that this and this, this differentiation here is largely artificial. Okay? The way we think about these things is pretty much has nothing to do with Christianity. Okay? First what we need to do is define science and religion. When you hear people define science in culture, what do they normally mean? The process of either proving or disproving theories about physical life. Okay. Or biology. So it's a process. Oops, I can spell. I won two spelling bees in elementary school. So whenever I just spell something, it drives me crazy. That like formed part of my identity, I think. All right, so it's a process of coming to certain truths. Yeah, like proving or disproving particular theories about life and the way things work. In the okay, so the process of proving theories. We've got proof there, good. Okay. So that is a definition of science, and that's largely promulgated in the scientific community today. Um, that science is a particular process aimed at arriving at truth about the world. This was not the definition of science prior to about the 18th century. Prior to that, science, coming from the Latin scientia, literally just meant knowledge. Okay. Um, science today is largely thought to only include natural science, which is to say, thinking about the natural world. And so, prior to the 18th century, people realized that the natural world is not the only arena of truth. Right? There are truths outside of that. Uh, people generally accepted that there's a supernatural spiritual realm, and there were truths uh, of that realm as well. Okay, so on your outline there, we have scientia is Latin for knowledge, and that's where the word omniscience comes from. What is omniscience? All-knowing. All-knowing. God is all-knowing. 
And so, really, the word science just means knowledge. And so to limit it to the natural world is to say something about what is possible to know. When you hear people object to Christianity and say that science proves that Christianity is wrong, they're saying that the entire body of all human knowledge, or all possible knowledge, is only on the natural world. It only comes from the natural world. And so they owe us an explanation of why that's true. The problem with that is that there is no clear line between what is and isn't science. When you start to try to define what science is, you inevitably leave out huge portions of human knowledge. So saying that you know that um, all knowledge comes from the natural world is saying that things like God doesn't exist, or that spirits don't exist, or that uh, miracles don't happen. Okay, anybody making that claim, though, has to bear a burden of proof to show that. All right, so science, we've shown, does not have a clear, distinct dividing line between what it is and what it isn't. Well, if there's no distinct dividing line, then how can you possibly say that God and spirits and those types of conclusions are excluded from science? Religion. Okay, religion comes from... a, a early Latin word, uh, religare, which reduces, or changed to religio, which is Latin for obligation. Um, kind of the same thing with science. When you start to try to define it, it becomes very difficult. So in, just throw out what you think a definition of religion might include. Belief. Belief, okay. The way in which we approach the spiritual world. Okay way we approach the spiritual world, that implies that there is a spiritual world. So are there religions that exclude the existence of a spiritual world? Okay? So here we're already starting to see there's a dividing line. Because there are some religions, or what are considered religions in the world, that are actually atheistic. That don't say that there's a spiritual world. So certain forms of Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, certain form, modern forms of Confucianism are aimed more at social uh, constructs and social uh, improvement than they are at any spiritual realm. So religion itself is a problematic term because when you start to define it, you're inev inevitably leaving out huge portions of people who say that they're religious but don't fall under any of the categories. All right, so We've got these two terms that are extremely slippery, right? So when somebody comes up to you and they say, there's a conflict between science and religion, what's the question you should ask? How are you defining those terms? Okay? If they can't give you a solid definition for science, and they can't give you a solid definition for religion, then how do they know that there's a conflict between science and religion? Right? Okay, any questions about how we're defining those terms. What do you think the majority of people are saying when they say that there's a, there's a conflict between science and religion? I think, what the, I think what they want to say is that Christianity is false. I think that's what the majority, because here in America, most people know that the conflict between science and religion is really the conflict between an omnipotent and sovereign God and the way they want to live their lives. That's the underlying reason. Um, it's largely emotional, not basic, not essentially rational. Um, so at the very bottom, I, I think it's an emotional reaction. Is that kind of covered? Yeah, I mean, I guess I think to myself about some of the people that I've talked to, and the, the sense I get a little bit from them is that they don't want to be duped into believing things that are false, and so they see the hard, cold facts of science as more yeah. appealing than the faith of religion and yeah. believing things that I can't see. That's common. Yeah. So today, you look at people like Bill Nye and uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and um, Richard Dawkins and these people who are, you know, they say that science is the area of rationality, of reason. So by definition, that excludes reason from the other realms of knowledge. And so you're absolutely right that a lot of people are scared of being duped. There are cults and false religions that obviously deceive people 
into believing very false things. Scientology, right? That's, it's a fiction that was made up last century, and yet it is caught on as a religion. Um, and we know this, we have the history of the religion itself. So, yes, people are, are duped, and we need to uh, be diligent in our conversations in giving reasons for why Christianity is true. That's why I think apologetics is so absolutely essential for the church today. Yes? Well, there's some challenges. I'm a retired educator, and we were required to teach core curriculum certain ways, science, et cetera, et cetera, and I might have a youngster come up to me and say, well, that's not true, my, my family thinks this and that, and I would have great respect for the guidance of their family, and I would just simply redirect them into that family's guidance because I couldn't, I had to present the text that was required by the school system to yeah. do that, and it was a very odd place to be yeah. because um, I have to respect the culture and the belief system the religion of the child, and I'm not going to argue against it. So there was a conflict between the religious beliefs of the child and what, and what was being said in the classroom. In the and so there's the textbook, there's the principal walking down the road, coming in to make sure you're on the right page with the right lesson. And so it's it is a very um, tricky business yeah. to be responsible and respectful mm -hmm. of you know people have a right to have their religion and to have their beliefs and still in terms of, what do you call it, your duty in a certain setting to, to be presenting things a certain way. It's really challenging. There is a sort of double standard when it comes to how teachers, how freely teachers are uh, able to express themselves. Um, if you're a, an atheist or a secular teacher, you have much more freedom to talk about your own personal beliefs in the classroom than you would be if you were a Christian or you know someone who holds to a particular religious view, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a little boy once, and we were <coughs> basically mandated to not bring our religion into the classroom. Yeah. Mandated. Okay, so you don't. You you believe it. You live it. You are who you are. And the little boy came up to me and said, "Mrs. Lesher, do you believe in God?" And I said. Yes, I do. And there was this huge sigh of relief. Like, oh. yeah. you know, and so I thought, you know what, it was a direct question and I'm responding to his question. I'm not proselytizing. Right. And so it's interesting that a lot of teachers are fearful today of talking about their personal uh, religious belief because they're, they're afraid they're crossing some type of boundary into a taboo or uh, you know, unauthorized area. We're talking about their personal beliefs is, you know, off limits. Um, I think. Tyson, yes. Um, before you leave that, um, I was also a teacher in my high school, yeah. and I used to just preface it with, "If you believe that prayer will help, then I suggest that's a good thing you should do right now." I never was called on it by a student or an administrator because I always said, "When they're going, if they're going to challenge me, then I'm going to say then." Please remove all of the signs of the zodiac from the library. Yeah, yeah there's a, there's a, and it's excellent that you worded it that way. There's a great power in using a conditional sentence, right? The way you use language allows you to say a lot of things. It still allowed me to be who I was and what I believed. Yeah. And not demanding that they also believe. But what you're, what you're, you're both hitting on is something that arose in this last century, and that's the. Facts, value split, value split, okay? So when you get a chance, look up Noma by a guy named Stephen J. Gould. Okay, Noma stands for non-overlapping magisteria. That's just a fancy way of saying science is science, Religion is religion, science is facts, religion and morality and all that stuff, those are values. These are set in stone, they don't change based on your opinion, these are all opinion. This is a split in philosophy that has taken hold largely in academia, and so things like morality and religion are seen as things that cannot be facts. 
And so you can't really have a set opinion about them. You can't say, well, this conforms to reality and is part of my religion. And so when you're talking about things like religious belief in the schools, there's, a large, there, there's an opinion that you can have your opinion, but that doesn't mean it's fact. What's the problem with that? What do religions include? A lot of them. Religions include fact claims. Okay? We believe that God created the universe. That is a claim to fact. We believe that places like Bethlehem and Jericho and Gath are real places that you can go excavate in the Middle East. You know, these are facts. And so the problem with this non-overlapping magisteria is that it, it, it completely mischaracterizes what a religion is. Religions include fact claims. And so this is a, a largely false dichotomy. Well, I think um, I've read some of this stuff. I think what you're saying is in science you have a hypothesis or an observation, and then it can be repeated, or it can be observed, or it could be repeated. And that's what he's basing his claim on versus a religious or a value system. Not everything, when it comes to religion or spiritual, can be observed exactly the same way and repeated. Yeah. I think there, so how would yeah, you, how and, when you, and when you define it that way, you're going to end up, like I said, leaving out huge portions of knowledge. So you said it's repeatable and observable. Okay? The problem with that is things that occur in the past are not repeatable. Right? So, Caesar crossing the Rubicon, is it a fact or isn't it? Okay? Is it repeatable? No. He's dead. Right? <laughs> so, that's not a repeatable fact. Uh, unless you believe in God and he's resurrected and crosses the Rubicon. So, in, in which sense, Christianity is true. Um, so, it, it's just false that things that are facts are only things that are repeatable and observable. And I think we all intuitively know that. It's just that when we're talking about Christianity and the truth of Christianity, people want to say that, so it undercuts the truth. Wouldn't you put that uh, seizure crossing the Rubicon in the category of history, historical fact, yes. rather than scientific fact? Yeah. And so that, that gets back to the question, what is science? Is science the only realm of knowledge? So that brings us to our next point. But just all things in science aren't repeatable. Say what? All things in science aren't repeatable. The right. Haley Comet or whatever it is or something happens once. Well, Haley's Comet goes every 70-something years. But sorry, there's some, there's some things right. Okay, let's take the initial singularity that created the universe. Right. Is that repeatable? Well, obviously not. So you're absolutely right that there are things that occur in history that are not repeatable. Okay. Any other questions about the definitions before we move on? Cool. Just feel free to throw out questions anytime. All right. So, science is based on assumptions. Okay. A lot of people don't realize this. A lot of people think that science is just, you know, all of the facts are out there. We're all looking at the same data. We're all going to interpret it the same. But science itself is built on certain assumptions that cannot themselves be proven by science. You have to assume certain things are true in order to do science. The first one I have there is the uniformity of nature. Uniformity of nature. So the uniformity of nature just uh, implies that the way things were in the past will continue in the future so that you can extrapolate past causes from current effects. So you see you know, um, you saw a ball drop today, you know, from here and it hit the floor, okay, and you've done that several times, you assume that it did the same thing in the past as well, so that people dropping the same ball at the same height would have had the same results, okay, and this is an assumption that you cannot prove. You can't go back into the past and show scientifically that the laws of nature have always been the same. This is an assumption that scientists make in order to perform their science. The second one, existence of the past. Okay? Anytime you have evidence, is it in the past, present, or future? Yes, past. Past. If you have evidence, oh, present, present. it's in the present. 
Okay? So how can you possibly have evidence of the past? All of your evidence is in the future, or in the present, I mean. So the problem here is that you can't actually have what they would consider scientific evidence of the past. You have to assume that the past is real, and then extrapolate from that. Uh, the third one is that there's a correspondence between conclusion statements and reality. So you have to assume that what you're talking about matches something external to you in reality. That there's a reality outside of you and that what you're talking about matches that. So if I say, there is a marker in my hand, those words match the reality of the marker in my hand. So there's a correspondence between our language and reality. Um, they assume that, and you can't really scientifically prove that. Fourth, reliability of our cognitive faculties. Cognitive faculties is just a fancy way of saying our senses. Okay, so the reliability of our senses. So any evidence that you have, how are you observing it? With your senses. Okay? How do you get outside of your senses to prove that your senses are reliable? You don't. You assume that they're reliable, and then you move from that assumption. Okay, so that's an assumption that science is built on. And we're going to come back to that. That's going to be an important point for showing why um, certain atheistic assumptions are false. And then the truth of mathematical language. Mathematical language. Science, as an enterprise, is largely built on math. But you can't prove mathematical truths scientifically. Can you? I mean, can we just think about this for a second? 2 plus 2 equals 4. Does that hold true even if there are no physical substances? I think so. We can just think about those terms. 2 plus 2 equals 4. And that holds true. How would you prove scientifically something like that? You don't. You, you, say, you might say, well, you have two apples and two more apples and you can just see that you know you put them together in a basket and that's four apples but the math is before the physical objects you're assuming that there are two apples but even that's based on the assumption that you're talking about base 10 exactly yeah so given certain axioms right um, yeah but it, it's it does seem like mathematical truths if they're true are necessary they couldn't have been different you are a teacher, aren't you? There's <laughs> a math teacher. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm stepping out of my realm then. I'm going to let you have the floor. No. Indeed not. All right, any questions about the assumptions of science? So we see that science is built on assumptions that can't be proven scientifically, right? So what does that mean? If we truly know things, that like the existence of the past and the uniformity of nature and the truth of mathematical language, then there are truths outside of science. Okay, so this is a great point to uh, to bring up to someone if you're in a conversation and they claim that there's no truth outside of science. Okay, any questions on that? All right, third point here: scientism versus or scientism and verificationism. Scientism is just a way of saying that someone thinks that science is either the only source of information or it's the most authoritative source of information. So I have their, the two senses. Strong scientism is the claim that only scientific propositions or theories are true. Someone who says that only scientific propositions or theories are true. So what are a couple problems with that? Based on what we've already talked about, who can show why that might be problematic? If somebody said to you, I think that only scientific propositions or theories are true, what would you say to them? There's always variables. They prove it. Okay. Well, you could go back to the history thing and say, well, if only scientific propositions and variables are true, then how did we get here? How did the United States become a nation? Because that wasn't done through science. So okay. historically, we can look back and see that Yes, the United States became a nation because these men did this thing and, you know, signed the Declaration of Independence and all that good stuff. 
Okay, so pointing to particular areas that we believe we have knowledge mm -hmm. that aren't scientific. Okay, that's one way. What about the first section? What did we talk about? Definition of science. Okay, so what's a question that we can ask that person? Define science. How are you defining science? Okay, again, we want to press them on their claim. You're saying that only scientific theories are true. But what do you consider science? And that's going to show how broad their scope is. And if they can't give you a good definition, then they're really not saying anything meaningful. Okay? So that's strong scientism. Weak scientism is that science is the most authoritative source of learning. So they don't make the claim that science is the only area of truth, but they do think that it's the best way to get to truth about the world. Okay, so that means things like history, anthropology, chemistry, whatever, those are lesser authorities. Okay, you kind of run into the same issues though. If there truly are historical truths, if there truly are historical truths, then what does it mean to say that science is the most authoritative source of learning? It's not most authoritative when it comes to these other areas of truth. In fact, science is incapable of giving you a lot of those truths. Moral truth. If there are such things as morals, certain things are right or wrong independent of what we believe about them, then science is incapable of giving you that. It can merely describe certain things. It can't prescribe. Okay, that's scientism. Uh, one form of scientism or a manifestation of scientism is what's called verificationism. So verificationism uh, was popular in the early 1900s. Uh, there was a group of intellectuals, they call the Vienna Circle, um, who espoused verificationism. And that was the claim that only what can be verified with the senses is meaningful. So anything, any kind of talk about anything that couldn't be verified with the senses was not meaningful. And so obviously, if you can't verify, or if, if you can't talk about God using your senses, then they considered that meaningful, meaningless. Um, the, the blank there is, uh, talk of God was literally meaningless because it was not empirically verifiable. Okay, what's the problem with verificationism? It's very limited. Okay, some of the same issues. The reason that almost no one continues to espouse verificationism is that it basically died on its own sword. The claim itself that only those things which are verifiable by the senses are meaningful, that claim is not verifiable by the senses. It's self-defeating. And so verificationism itself falls on its own sword. And so that's why many philosophers have just discarded it completely uh, as hopeless to give a theory of knowledge and meaning. Okay, uh, I wanted to point out too that the most popular theories of physics are built on verificationism. So this includes relativity the Einstein's relativity theories and uh, quantum theory. But what's the problem there? Well, relativity theory and quantum theory are incompatible. They actually can't go together as they are right now, which is why scientists are scrambling to find some way to bring them together in harmony. So when someone says that science is incompatible with religion, you can say that, well, certain theories in science are incompatible with each other. And if physics is the, the foundational aspect of science, then you've got a major problem because not even the pillars of your physics, relativity theory and quantum theory, are compatible. So there might be a conflict between science and religion, but only because the science that you have is incoherent right now. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, and let's be honest, not all religions are Christianity. There are religions that have concepts of God that are incoherent. So we do want to say that, yes, certain religious claims are false. But that implies that they can be true as well. Okay? Any questions about scientism and verificationism? 
Okay, down to the topic of miracles. So Christianity is a miracle religion. Okay, we believe that miracles happen. Who can name, all right, this is a question I love to throw out. What is the greatest miracle in Christianity? The resurrection. Okay, the resurrection. Anybody else? Water into wine. Water into wine, okay. Yeah. Just being born into a virgin. Incarnation. Okay. Creation. I like that. Which one? Creation. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the greatest miracle of all. It is. It is. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're a miracle religion. And so we need to be able to give an account of how miracles are able to exist in our world where the claim is made that miracles conflict with science. Right? Who's heard that claim before? Yeah, I think pretty much all of us have. So the common definition here of a miracle that I'm sure all of us has heard is that it's a violation of the laws of nature. Okay? A violation of the laws of nature. But what does this imply? This implies that the laws of nature are fixed, that you cannot violate them, that they represent something that um, anything that you claim goes against it is obviously thrown out because the laws of nature must be the way, the way that they are. Okay? There's some issues in there, right? We're going to see that here in a second. As Christians, we want a better definition because obviously we don't believe that miracles are a violation of the laws of nature. So the better definition is that an event which natural causes at a certain time and place uh, cannot bring about. So miracles are an event which natural causes at a time and place cannot bring about. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so there's a difference between a natural cause and a supernatural cause. And that's why it's called supernatural. It's yes. outside of the realm of natural. Absolutely. So we do believe as Christians that there is a realm outside of nature. Um, God, angels, our own spirits, those are not natural entities. And so we do believe that those are causal entities. The laws of nature describe what would happen naturally in a particular case given no intervening supernatural factors. I want you to make sure and get that last part. Given no intervening supernatural factors. Okay? So this is, the laws of nature include certain what are called ceteris paribus assumptions, meaning all things being equal, if nothing else is included, then the laws of nature hold. Okay? But if God exists, and he acts in the world, then not all things are equal. There are certain, there's information coming into the system. It's not a closed system. And so uh, it depends on how you view the laws of nature. What is a law of nature? Oh, go ahead, Scott. I just had a question regarding you know miracles that sometimes people will call miracles that really I wouldn't say are miracles. Yep. In fact, like medical science, yeah. when people are healed through medical procedures, is that really miraculous? Are we actually going outside of the realm of natural law in those situations? Yep, and that's that last point there. What we usually call a miracle is actually normally providence. So there's God's ordinary act of sustaining the universe and allowing the natural causes to bring about their effects. He concurs with the natural causes to bring about their effects. That's what we would call ordinary providence. And then his extraordinary work, where he inputs new information, that's what we would call a miracle. So, as Christians, I think we're far too loose in the way we use the word miracle. Like, oh, I found a parking spot really close to the store, What's a, it's a miracle. Really? <laughs> really God, like, you know, annihilated a car out of that parking spot so that you could have that? Right, come on. I'd yeah. like to believe that. Yeah, so we've kind of lost touch with this word providence. We don't use it very much. I would just encourage you guys to try and incorporate that more into your, your conversation. Um, and just using it in, in a sentence with people who aren't Christians, they're going to be like, providence, what in the world is that? What do you mean? Like, are you, have you been reading the dictionary? Like, so uh, that allows you to talk about the difference. Yes? But well, I bet you most of us in here have at one time or another prayed for a parking space or, <laughs> or something similar. So if that occurs, can't you classify it as a blessing? 
A blessing, absolutely. Yeah, I would say ordinary providence is full of blessings. Uh, common grace. God reigns, you know, he brings the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, right? So, in God's ordinary providence, he does give many, many blessings. So you can say I find a parking place because of the providence. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's the normal way we, you know, when we pray to thank God for things, the majority of what we're praying for are God's providence. And given that he's an omniscient being, how easy would it be for him to arrange things so that the natural causes bring about certain things that really make an impression on us that, wow, God is looking out for me, God is really, you know, involved personally in my life. I think that's well within his power. There's these people that pray for rain and people that don't want it to rain. How do you deal with that? <laughs> well, here in California, the people that pray for no rain are evil. <laughs> so... Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you need to question their salvation, though. No. All right, so back to miracles. All right, so I was about, I was about to say, what is a law of nature? If you had to just give, you know, sort of, sort of yes. Okay, that's an example of a law of nature. What makes it a law? It's always the same. Okay, is it necessary that it is the same all the time? Is it, is, there, is it a law in the sense that it can't be violated or broken? No, but it's certain parameters that it, it couldn't if it's a natural law. So yeah. like, for instance, gravity in the sun is going to be different than here on Earth because the certain cir the circumstances are different in that realm. But it is always going to be the same in those particular circumstances. Okay, good. So how is it that we have arrived to what we call the laws of nature. How did we get to the point where we can say gravity is a law of nature? What process did we go through? Scientific method. Okay, scientific method. I heard you say observation. So we observed certain things, what seem like they're falling or masses moving towards each other, and they do it pretty regularly at very, you know, distinct rates given their sizes. Okay, and so we calculated those things, and there's the formula for gravity that seems to hold pretty well for certain objects. Okay, but that whole process is descriptive. I want you to write down that word if you're taking notes. The laws of nature are descriptive which means that they are descriptions of what we have observed so far. They're descriptions of what we've observed so far. Okay? If they're mere descriptions, then anything that falls outside of our description or that doesn't conform to it, say you release a ball from here and it floats upward, suddenly you've observed something that doesn't fit in the description. Okay? But that means that you're going to have to adjust your description to fit your observation. You don't fit your observation to fit your description. Right? The observation is reality. Reality is out there. It's informing your description. Your description isn't making reality what it is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I don't want to lose you here, but Say you have gravity, you know, okay, these are all the times that you've observed the ball falling down, okay, and that's the one time that you observed the ball falling up, okay? If you have a description of gravity and you suddenly have this observation, what happens to your description of gravity? It changes. It's placed in, in doubt. Right. And not just doubt, but because laws of nature are descriptive, you can no longer go with a description that excludes this observation. You have to include that in your law of nature. But if, the, but if you have 10 million marks on the left side and only one on the right, how do you reconcile those things? Unless it's a, mir a miraculous you know, event. Right. For instance, Jesus rising up into the air, it's like, okay, you don't see, you've never seen that before in the history of mankind, and now here's this one guy rising up in the So air. there's two possibilities there. 
One, it was a miracle. So the ordinary law, the, the, the ordinary natural causes and effect that in space and time at that particular point could not have produced that effect, and so there must have been a supernatural cause bringing about that effect. Or what you think are the natural causes at that point in space and time are not the whole full story. There are other natural causes. There was a magnetic force of some sort that was in the vortex of a black hole and, you know, whatever. Right. Some that, natural description of why it happened. That would be a natural cause that would change your description of what you've observed. Okay? Does that make sense? So, if you have all these, ball falls down. This one, ball falls up. Then you can't say that all of your observations have led to balls falling down. Okay? So, all I wanted to get out of that is that laws of nature are descriptive, not prescriptive. Laws of nature don't make reality what they are. Reality makes the laws of nature. That's a good point. Okay. So, we're running out of time. i got to go real quickly. Go ahead. Did you have a question? How can a ball fall up? <laughs> well, uh... Could God make a ball fall up instead of down? So it could be a miracle, right? You believe in miracles? Okay. Uh, we're not going to have time to get through all of this, so show of hands. Who wants to hear about evolution? Who wants to hear about the evolutionary argument against naturalism? Who wants to hear about intelligent design? Okay. Most people, most people want to hear intelligent design. We'll go with that. All right. What is intelligent design? First of all, all Christians believe in some type of intelligent design. If you believe that God is an intelligent being, then you believe that he created the universe, then you believe in intelligent design. So that's a lowercase intelligent design. And that's not what most people talk about when they talk about intelligent design. In the technical sense, and so we differentiate by capitalizing uh, the initials there of intelligent design, it's uh, a way to seek to justify the conclusion that a particular phenomenon was designed in some way by an intelligent being. Is that the Pomerodians group of scientists that came to that? I'm sorry? The Pomerodians group of scientists that came to that? There's a, I mean, there's many different groups that have come up with it. And this argument has been, intelligent design is not a new concept. That's been, come, that's been around for centuries. Uh, you read the work of Paley, William Paley, and he had the watchmaker argument. So you come across a watch on the beach, you can infer design just based on the appearance of design in the object itself. So what is intelligent design? A lot of people say that it's creationism smuggled in into a scientific package. Okay? But intelligent design itself is neutral on whether or not God exists. It just means that we're able to detect some type of intelligence behind a thing, an event, uh, you know, a, a, an object, what, a, what have you. Okay, so we want to separate creationism from intelligent design. They're two separate issues. Okay, what are the conditions for intelligent design? Um, if you look at an object, say, you know, this board, how would you, how would you come to the conclusion that you know, the words or the board itself was intelligently designed. Well, some philosophers have come up with two criteria. Number one, they think it's extraordinarily improbable that natural causes would have combined these elements in this way in a perfectly rectangular form with these nice rounded edges and this little lip that, you know, has stuff sitting on it. That's extraordinarily improbable just given random fluctuation of uh, natural causes. And then, and, uh, number two, an independently given pattern. Okay, independently given pattern. Uh, and what that means is that it just looks like there's a pattern that it follows um, that doesn't seem to be from natural causes. So there are criteria that we can use to say that certain things are intelligently designed. And anybody that says that intelligent design is false, you just ask them. So you don't think that anything you own was intelligently designed? That it's all randomly created? 
Well, if they say that something in their house is intelligently designed, then there has to be a way to determine how we can show that something is intelligently designed. This should probably be labeled a philosophical rather than a scientific theory um, because we're not dealing with specifically natural causes, right? We're saying that the natural causes probably wouldn't have produced something like this board. Okay? Um, when someone says that intelligent design is false, ask them to define intelligent design. Usually they'll say, well, it's creationism, and so it's false. How does that show that intelligent design is false? Okay, it doesn't. And then finally, theistic science versus methodological naturalism. Okay, naturalism is the view that only nature exists. So by methodological naturalism, we mean that people who approach science seek only natural causes. But if they're only seeking natural causes, what are they not going to find? Anything outside of natural causes. So let's say these are the two possibilities, and this is supernatural, and this is natural. If they're only looking for what's in here, they're not going to find what's in here. If they're not even open to this area, then they're possibly missing perfectly good explanations for phenomena out there. So if they're not even at, uh, open to it, then they're probably not going to find it. Um, and that's why I think theistic science is what we as Christians need to hold to. Um, God is a perfectly good explanation for a lot of the phenomena out there. Um, the existence of anything at all is explained better by God than not. Uh, the existence of the beginning of the universe is better explained by God than not. The fine-tuning of the universe mm -hmm. hey, uh, is better explained by God than not. Morality, better explained by God than not. The resurrection of Jesus, which I think we can prove historically, is better explained by God than not. And so as Christians, if we are able to include supernatural hypotheses as explanations in our science even, which is just knowledge, then we should hold to theistic science rather than methodological naturalism. Didn't leave a whole lot of time for open I think what we'll do with questions, if you're not going to second service and you want to stick around and you know ask Tyson some questions, I don't know what your time frame is here, Tyson. No, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah and, and you want to just stick around and, and discuss things for a while, you're welcome to do that. Some of us need to go get things ready for our second service. But let's um, give Tyson a hand and, mm -hmm. and thank you for coming. Thank you, God, for Tyson. We just pray for your blessing over him and the ministry of apologetics that he's involved in, Lord. And help us as we also talk to those who are in doubt of you out there, Lord God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody. If you have questions for Tyson, go ahead and fire away. I'm <laughs> 
For students, it's very, it's a very sensitive thing because you absolutely want them to respect the authority of the teacher. And since the teacher has all the authority in the classroom, it's a very bad environment for the baby. But, and so, um, it was just as I don't know if you've read Greg Kokel's tactics, he talks about if you are in that situation where you have power dynamics that is so one-sided, the best thing to do is ask a probing question. Okay, so, so the student should be able to ask, you know, what do you mean by that? How did you arrive at that? You know, um, if they say, you know, Students, since they're not the one making the claim, she'll say, You're making the claim. Yeah, it was more. I told you so. I